I got to tell you, there is a profound word that's coming forth, and the Lord is uncovering things in the culture today in a way that many people might not have thought would be happening. And I'm about to go into this with my guest today, Rick Renner. And just before I bring him on, I want to say to you, please repost this, share this everywhere you can, because whenever I talk with Rick, it's so profound and such revelatory information comes out. I'm telling you, somebody is going to get something out of this. Can I please say to you too, when you repost it, it helps people hear the word of the Lord. They get a now word. And also I want to say a very big thank you to every one of you who is a partner in this ministry. When you partner here, it is changing lives all over the world. And if you want to join our partner family, I'd encourage you to do it today, right now by going to josephz.com because we will call you regularly and we will stand with you. We care about our partners very, very much. Well, I, I really want to get into this. This is very important today, and I know this is going to help you. Would you please help me welcome Rick Renner to the broadcast? Today? I'm glad to be with you, Mr. Z. Thank you, Rick. What a privilege to be with you. Thank you. You know, whenever I get an opportunity to have you with me, it's just such a privilege. I run for the opportunity to be with you. <laughs> I do too. I'll travel across the world literally to thank be with you. Thank you. Well, we just recently went to the site of Noah's Ark. We did. You know, we did some programs a while back talking about we're going to go there, and now we've been there. We've been there again. Yeah, you've been there several times, but this was my first time. I'll tell you, it changed my outlook on biblical understanding. You know, when we came around the bottom of the, of the ark, Heather broke into tears. She did. I mean, she just broke into tears. She did, Rick. I said, Heather, are you all right? She said, I'm just overwhelmed to think this is really where the ark came to rest. It is. And she, she was so touched because it's where society began or where we re-began. And Joel was there. It was, it was wonderful. Thank and you. Denise. And Denise. Of course. Denise was a trooper. She's amazing. I'm telling you. You know, I, she always wanted to go. I said, Denise, it's pretty rugged. Yep. But I'm going to tell you what, she did as good as any of us. I know she did. She marched all over, sang at times. She did. <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, Rick, thank you for taking us on that. And, you know, one of the reasons that I was so touched by being there is because of the information and revelation you have about the ark, where we're going as a culture. And you wrote this book. And we'll get into this more by the end of the program today and broadcast. But this is fallen angels, giants, monsters, and the world before the flood. How the events of Noah's ark and the flood are relevant to the end of the age. I'll get to tell you, I've read this book cover to cover. And this book is it is packed with information. You know, I was very hesitant to write that book. Okay. Because many people who get into these subjects about the Watchers and the Fallen Angels and the Nephilim and the Giants and the yes. Monsters, they also talk about the Hollow Earth. I know. Or the Flat Earth. I know. Or yeah. the Big into Bigfoot. Or I mean, they're <laughs> just into so many weird things. All the things. And I thought, I don't want to be affiliated with all of that. <laughs> but what's in that book is the truth. Well, this is factual. It's factual, and I just believed it needed to be addressed from a scriptural, historical viewpoint. Yep. And that's what this is. I want to congratulate you, too, because, you know, as we're right now doing this, this book is literally exploding. It is. It is global. It's like a phenomenon. You know, Joseph, I have never, never in my life have I ever written a book for sales. Wow. It's just, that's just not who I am. I just I want love to write that. a book that's going to help people. I love that about you. But I'm thrilled to see that people are really buying that book. Well, it's helping people. It that's, is. That's what you're saying. That's the purpose of it. And even though it's exploding and going everywhere, that just means it's really helping people. And I believe that you hit the nail on the head for this season because, and, and brings up a point I, I actually want to get into just for a second. And that is you're bringing up so many things about these wild, sensational things that are happening. Everything from the Nephilim, which about 10 years ago, very few people even knew what that term was. And now meant. it's everywhere. And now it's mainstream. And a lot of it's nutty stuff. It is nutty. And that's why that book is important. This is not nutty. Well, I like to use the word, it right-sizes things. That's your, that's your phrase, and I like it. Well, it, it does, because this terminology of Nephilim, uh, everything, you know, there's a huge phenomenon with Skinwalker Ranch and all right. that. And a lot of it is is true. There's very interesting things that are happening. But we got to remember, whenever things go mainstream, I believe there's a grieving that can happen too, where it starts to go off the rails. Right. And that's why this book is so good because well, you, thank you. you keep it central. Thank you. You keep the main thing the main thing. Well, you know, in the days before the flood, there really was a nefarious moment. Mm -hmm. God, I mean, God is so good. 
Yeah. That when Adam and Eve blew it and they were kicked out of the garden, God in his goodness set angels over the earth. Now, they were called watchers, and some people today say, watchers, are you sure? Everybody believes in guardian angels. It's true. It's the same thing. The they same. were guardian angels. Yeah. And they were set over the earth to help man in his fallen state. And we read in Genesis chapter 6, I've got my Bible open. Come on. It says in verse 2, the sons of God mm -hmm. saw the daughters of men that they were fair, yep. and they took them wives of all that they chose. Well, that phrase, sons of God, is an Old Testament expression which refers to angels. Wow. These were angels. Yes. And, now think about it, there's no such thing as a female angel. That's right. You can't find it anywhere in the Bible. No. Nope. So heaven is populated with male angels, but when these male angels suddenly were put over humankind and saw women, Man. That was fascinating to them. Yeah. And they saw that they were beautiful, mm -hmm. and they took them. The King James Version says wives, but yes. it actually was mates. Mates. And notice it says took them. Took them. There is in this text the idea of abduction or perhaps even sexual abuse or rape. Wow. They took these women. How terrible. And they copulated with them, and the women became pregnant, mm -hmm. and the women gave birth to Nephilim. Yep who were giants. Yep. This is not a fantasy. No, it's not. This is a really a real period in human history. Well, what I find fascinating too, Rick, is you know, having read your book, there's a whole part where you show the early church fathers. They all believed it. They all believed it. There's a whole chapter in there called What Ancient Voices Say About the Fallen Angels and Giants. It's amazing. They write in unison. Yes. For hundreds and hundreds of years, everybody, everybody believed this until the time of Augustine. Really? And during the time of Augustine, the church was really trying to break free of Greek mythology and pagan mythology. So Augustine developed a new doctrine about this verse, the sons of God, to try to break with the past. Yeah. He said these were the sons of Seth. The Sethite thing. Well, why didn't the sons of Seth have weird sons before that? <laughs> so all of a sudden the sons of Seth are producing monsters? <laughs> these were angels. They were. And Jude writes about it. Yes, he did. Peter writes about it. And they are explicit in what they write. Yes. And Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. Yes. And the book of Enoch is not a biblical book, but I have to tell you, Joseph, that for years and years and years, I wouldn't even read the book of Enoch. I said, ugh, nonsense. It's just fabricated. But you know what? The first 36 chapters are really old. Wow. Now, there's many chapters. Mm -hmm. But the first 36 chapters probably predate the flood. Mm. Well, Noah was the offspring of Enoch. He was his grandson. That's it. So when he went on the ark, he carried those earliest parts of the book of Enoch with him onto the ark, and it survived. And we even know that the children of Israel in Egypt, and for 1,000 years afterward, read the book of Enoch, which means the book of Enoch precedes the Bible. Yes, it does. And so what seems to us like such new information was considered to be just generally known information. Well, Jesus, Jesus, I learned this from you, but Jesus would have known about the book of Enoch. Yeah, I mean, Jude was his brother. Yes. His half-brother. Yes. So it means the family of Jesus was reading the book of Jude because Jude, Jude quotes from it. Well, so I think you used the book term, of Enoch. The book of Enoch, yes. The book of Enoch is like a commentary. It is. Yeah. So it's not Bible, but it's like a commentary That's that right. has facts and information in it. Now, there are some denominations around the world that actually include it. Yes. Like in Ethiopia, it's included as part of the canon. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. Right. But I think it is a serious historical document. Now, here's something I want to... Also wanna, the Book of the Giants. The Book of the Giants also. The Book of the Jubilees, the Book of Jasser. Mm. All of those were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948. So the Essene Jews, who were very prophetic and very focused on the end of the age, they took all of those books very seriously. Yes. Well, I'm I'm so great. You deal with Enoch so well in this book. Thank and you. You helped me deal with it too in one of my books. I'm so grateful for Good. that. You know, in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament, the book of Enoch was one of the most popular reads. Was it really? And during the first century, when Jesus was growing up, they were just enthralled with the book of Enoch. Everybody was reading the book of Enoch. Mm. And so they took it very serious. And then strangely, it disappeared just disappeared to the sands of time. And it was found in its entirety in Ethiopia, I believe in 1773, and then great portions of it were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. That is remarkable. It just reemerged. It's, it's prophetic. It is. The Lord, I, 
I believe the Lord hides things and reveals things. And speaking of that, Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. I mean, Noah's Ark. You, you'd mentioned this. And so Noah's Ark was discovered by locals mm-hmm. in 1948. I learned this with you, from you, that there was an earthquake and might have revealed it. But then you mentioned that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found that same year. Right. And? Israel was reestablished as a nation. What a prophetic trifecta. I mean, that's uh, is, amazing. Isn't that amazing? It is. So here's what I'd like to do. I was with you there. You were. At Noah's Ark. And, and I want to say thank you for going. Oh, Rick. <laughs> what a tremendous time that was. We dealt with cold. We, we dealt did. with rain. We dealt with hail. <laughs> that hailstorm was amazing. It was amazing. But you know, when you're in the mountains of Ararat, mm-hmm. you run into all kinds of weather. And it changes by the minute. Just like that. Yeah. Uh, we even went to the headwaters of the Euphrates. We did. Man, to be there where it's talking about the angels that are bound and they're going to be released and just listening to your commentary on it, Rick, it just really adjusted my perspective and I got prophetic words out of it. Wow. It was amazing. But here's, I want to show a clip Okay. of when you and I and, of course, our wives and team, your team was there. This is us climbing up the side of Noah's Ark and Maybe we can show it, and I'd like to get your commentary on this. You know, they can't really see this from the photo, but this is quite steep. It is. So this is the bottom part of the ark. This is the right side of the ark. When you're standing down on this lower end yes. is when you really see the enormity of the ark. That's right. I mean, it was massive. It is massive. So then you come up around the bottom side, and we're coming up here, and this is where you begin to see the rib structures. Yes. And uh, they're really there. They, they really are. You can see them. You can. Well, let's watch a little bit of this and stop it wherever you'd like, Rick, but I I just want to watch it a little bit. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go on memory lane, Joseph. (laughs) There we are. This is that big gully right alongside of it. Yes, sir. By the way, it's pretty treacherous. It is. You can't tell that. This is deep. Yes. I mean, it's really deep. This is the top of the ark going all the way. Here we are coming up the side. (laughs) There's Denise. There's Joseph. (laughs) Heather. And then we came up around, let's stop here just for a moment. So here we are with Andrew Jones, Mm -hmm. and Andrew is really the number one authority today on the ruins of the ark. He knows all about it. Isn't he a nice guy? He is, and he he really went into information about how the Science Channel, different people were doing History Channel, yeah, National Geographic Channel, they've all been there. And they ask all the questions, and maybe I'm getting ahead here, but I get this question all the time. Why don't they just excavate the place? And... The answer is there's a lot of complications to why they don't. And what are those complications? Well, it's a geo, well, what can we say? It's Iran's right there. Right. We've got uh, uh, Turkey and Armenia. Armenia. Yep. That's right. And they got to go through a lot of levels of governmental permission. It's kind of a conflict zone. It is. And Turkey doesn't really want to put a whole lot of attention on that part of Turkey. No. And it's very fragile. The ark is very fragile. Yeah. And so without doing an an excavation, They've used ground-penetrating radar. They've used ERT scans. And with those, you can basically look inside the ship without ever putting the shovel into it. It's remarkable. You can see rooms, corridors, decks, timbers, beams. You can see it all. And the most recent analysis shows there's a central corridor, and part of it is still vacated. Yes. So if you were short enough, you could actually still walk through the very middle of the ark. That's amazing. And I think Andrew said that that part of the ark matched the one in Kentucky, the the attraction. It's that, funny because when I tell people I've been to the ark, <laughs> they always say, yeah, we've been to Kentucky. I know it. <laughs> I, well, I've never been to that one, but I've been to the real Noah's I Ark. Know. You know what's amazing, and we'll keep watching this in a moment, but Rick, when we were standing here, if you look the other way from where we're standing, you can see the border of Iran. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're right. They're looking at you. You're looking at them. And that was kind of sobering. And the Silk Road. And the Silk Road. It's right above the location of the Ark. And the ancient people who traveled the Silk Road regularly wrote that when they were traveling the Silk Road, they would detour just down the hill to the ruins of the Ark. There it is. I don't know why in the world people have been looking on Mount Ararat. I know it. It's in the mountains of Ararat. And in this... Is Mount Ararat behind us here? In it's this? right back there. Right back there, yep. yeah. So we're in the mountains of Ararat. We are. So wonderful. And probably Ararat, as we know it today, probably didn't even exist at the time of the flood because it's a stratovolcano. Yeah. I mean, it's built and built and built and built. And so that's kind of a new 
development. And for the viewers, stratovolcano means that the lava comes up and right. over and right. over, and it right. buries the mountain upon itself. That's right. So very well are. stated. Yeah. Should we keep watching this? Yeah. Let's do it, Elijah. Inside, and what you're looking at are the timbers of the ship. Andrew, please now, tell us about these. let's stop that just for a minute. Yeah, so, so you can actually, when you're there, I don't know if this shows it so well, but you can see there are parallel lines yeah. that run all along here. And this is where the deterioration of the mud is beginning to expose the beams yes. of the ark. And you, you can really see them. You see the contours of them and oh, then yeah. popping out. It, it's truly remarkable. It okay. is. This is the spot where you're seeing the erosion around where there are solid or broken up pieces of rib timber right underneath here. the surface. These are, these are so all everything's covered timbers. in mud, yes. but below the surface you have Look at these this. solid pieces. And here you really and see them how very we know clearly. That is because it's so the, evident. Can we stop that just for a moment? So this is the outer rim of the ark, yes. and this is going down on that right side where we are. It's very, very tall. It is. And this big hump in the middle, people have lots of questions about this hump. Yeah. Well, the reason there's a hump in the middle is because running all along the top of the ark, there was an atrium. That atrium collapsed, the dirt covered the top of it, and that's what you're seeing here. That's amazing. And this big rock in the middle of it, mm -hmm. a lot of people said, Ah, oh, that rock is the reason for this big formation. But now we know because of the ERT scans and grand penetrating radar, that rock does, did not start here. It either came down with the ship or rolled into the ship. This, this is not connected to bedrock. This is a free floating object in the middle of a real mud field. Is it mud, Joseph? It's mud all around it. I mean, if you go there, you're gonna ruin your shoes, I promise you. <laughs> well, you took us in a tractor ride it was a it was a very rough tractor ride that you had to go up and up and up and we got to see the area where this ark would have landed and it's huge it's a big indentation massive and you could see where it slid down to where it is at every turn wherever you look i i became a believer because of looking at so many of these things a believer in this site let's continue okay electrical uh, resistivity scans we did in 2014 they were trying to put the pins in at one of the spots on this western side, and they hit a solid 20 foot by two feet wide rock, you know, petrified wood is rock, and it was two inches below the surface. And they didn't know what it was, but it bent the steel pin. Wow. And when they got the ERT results back, it showed a solid rib timber still preserved below the surface there. And so we're actually looking at the eroded rib timbers of Noah's Ark. Yes. Can you all see how symmetrical they are? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. This mm -hmm. would not occur in natural erosion. Right. So when it rains and erosion takes place, it's really exposing these rim Can we stop that just for a minute? I want to show you something else. Please. See these cliffs at the top? These ones here? Yes. Yes, sir. That's really important to this story. Yeah. Because in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which mm -hmm. is older than the Bible, wow. it tells the story of the builder of the ark. And it says that when the ark landed, mm -hmm that the builder of the ark and his family animals left the ark. Yep. And they built their first village below a saddleback mountain. Look at that. That's what that is. That's a saddleback. And it was called the place of the rising of the sun. Well, that's exactly where the sun comes. And this kind of protects the people living just on this side of that cliff. And today, if you go to the bottom of that cliff, there really are the foundations of buildings from thousands and thousands of years ago. And what is very strange is the petroglyphs that are carved on the side of those cliffs. Elephants, giraffes, rhinoceros, none of those are native to Turkey. They're not indigenous. But they were on the boat. That's amazing. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 10, 30, that the first settlement built after the flood was called Misha. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what the name of that is today? Mishar. Right. It's the modern derivative of Misha. That is the very place where Noah and his boys and their family first settled. And then as the waters continued to abate and the waters continued to go down, it took yes. time. You can imagine. Oh. They begin to follow the waters down. Mm -hmm. So they left the ark, they left this location, and eventually they went down into the valley below. Yes. And that's where Noah became a vine dresser. Amazing. It's, it's all there. And, and the village of eight. The village there. of eight, that's the name of it. And in the valley down below, you see drogue stones, these giant... Now, what's things. a drogue stone? Well, it's a giant stone about the size of a Volkswagen. And it looks like an anchor. And it looks like an anchor with a hole in the top of it. Right. 
and it's it was made to balance the ship. That's correct. And I, I learned this, of course, through your book, through all this. And they found 26 of them. 26. And so if you follow those drogue stones, it's kind of like following breadcrumbs. Yes. As the ship began to slow mm -hmm. and the waters became more calm, they began to cut those stones. And if you follow the drogue stones, you can see how this, this edifice, this ship, just turned and sailed right up into this lower mountain. That is so amazing. And a lot of people, you know, one of the things I've heard people say is, I thought it was like a square barge. It know? is not. That but is it's a not. modern concoction. <laughs> if you look at this, it is exactly the shape of an ancient ship. It's got a, a rounded stern, a pointed bow. It's exactly an ancient ship. Well, even looking at this image right here, when we stood here and we were in this area all over it, if you look, and I, and I don't know if everybody can see it, but you can see the mud flow. Oh, yeah. You can see from where the ark was, and all of this is moving all alongside of it. And it just, it looks like a flow of earth. This stays the same. Joseph, put your finger up on the bow of the ship. Right here. When you stand there, yeah. you know you're standing on the bow of a ship. You know you are. It is absolutely true. It's, I mean, it is the bow of a ship. It is. And especially when you see this from the perspective of a drone, you, you, know. you know you're looking at a ship. I found it funny, Andrew Jones said this when we were there, that other people who have different expeditions to different places, and God bless everybody, but they, they had said, well, this can't be the site because there's a lot of geological formations just like this all over the area. And that's not true. There are not. There's none. It is not true. There's none, and we looked. And most of the people who say that have never even been to Turkey. <laughs> it's true. And, and sadly, the reason sometimes people want to refute this is because a lot of other agencies will lose their resources. That's correct. If they're going in, and God bless them. And most of those who have tried to debunk this yeah. wrote their material about 1990. Yeah. Well, since 1990, that's when all the scans have been done. All the ground penetrating radar, ERT, everything that's come out since then. Yes. Right from the top, running all the way down to this rock, there is a central corridor. Right here. Right in this area, right here. This is where the corridor is? Ground, it runs from the top about to where the rock yes, is. Yes, sir. Yep. Then in this area right here, the scans have shown three decks, compartments, rooms. Right you angles. You can clearly see them, right angles. It's, it's astonishing. You don't see those things in nature. You don't. You just don't. Well, let's keep going. All right. This is fun. I'm enjoying this very much. Now, you're looking at these. Think how many there had to be to support a structure this size. Again, the enormity of this project, the money and the manpower. Stop. And the, yeah. See down here? These are beams. Beams. See the erosion, how the yep. erosion is going around. That erosion is flowing around That's what is under the dirt. We wa I remember walking right here. And yes, Rick, that is profound. Now today, the, the shape of the ship is being destroyed because shepherds. Shepherds. Shepherds are taking their sheep up on the top to graze. They, they couldn't do that until the earthquake took place. Right. But especially back up here. I mean, they're really wearing down the sides of flocks and flocks and flocks of sheep. But this really is the ruins and of Noah's Ark. thousands of years old. And another thing that, that you guys had talked about when we were there, the Silk Road being above it. Right. That when tourists, we'll call them that, came, Ancient tourists. They would take pieces of it. They would take pieces and of it. And that's why you have the base that's left. They would especially take the pitch, mm. and they, because it was tar and it was hardened, it's called biddicum, mm. and they would carve it into amulets, and they would wear it as necklaces. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. Okay, let's keep going, Elijah. The assignment that God gave to Noah to construct this ship. Now, this is the bow of the ship. That's so awesome. And you can't tell it from this. This is really steep. It is. I mean, if one oh. one wrong foot here, and you would tumble, tumble, tumble. You know, I find it interesting. I'm just going to say this. You know, Rick, keeping up with you is a task. Because you, you, I mean, you lead when we're here, and it's wonderful. But we're, we're chasing you. And just so everybody knows, like, keeping up with Rick Renner is a, it is a task. <laughs> well, and, and it's wonderful. You. But we shot so many programs. But I remember you standing there and thinking, that is a treacherous position. Oh, I, I, honestly, I don't like to stand here and film. Yeah. Because the wind is also blowing. You could easily be blown off that. You could be. And it's, it would be quite a tumble. It really would be. Joseph, I want to say thank you for you and Heather 
Thank you, Going sir. with me and Denise and our team. Rick, I feel a calling to do these things with you. And thank you for inviting us and allowing us to. Well, thank you. It was a great privilege for us. It was really a privilege. And going to see the ruins in the valley below where oh. a Byzantine church was built possibly on top of the ruins of Noah's, Noah's house. We did a Bible study there. We did. <laughs> it was wonderful. That was great. Uh, one of the things that really impacted me was when we went to the altar of Noah. Oh, uh, that's the my altar. favorite thing. It was so emotional. Why was it emotional? Well, because when you recognize that this very likely was the place that Noah did a sacrifice and the rainbow appeared and God made his promise. And is either that or another location nearby. But I'll tell you, it, it, Pastor Paul, your son, Pastor Paul, was there and he is greatly impacted by it. He is. And he would talk about it with me as we stood there. And then to be there with you, we did a live broadcast from that position. And it just is, um, as much as this is amazing and being near it, at the altar of Noah is where you realize God's covenant. And it's where you looked and you pointed out and said, everything you see would have been mud. And so Noah stepped out. The animals didn't want to get off the ark. They were probably traumatized. They were the inheritors of a mess. Nothing there. The world was mud. Nothing. But there. I want to ask you, yes. for the sake of your viewers. Okay. Okay. We were sitting on top of that big altar stone. Yeah. What was that? What was just right at our feet? There was car. There was carving right in the rock, that looked like um, the place where bloodletting would happen. It was a channel made yeah. for bloodletting. Carved it out so when they do sacrifices, the animal's blood could flow. You can even see the place where the sacrifices were, where the blood would have gathered. Oh and then how it flowed off the side of the ark. What I'd like to do is show a quick clip of this where you sure. and I were there. I think it's good for the viewers. So let's look at this here. The Bible says that Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and this is that altar. Can we I say that. something? Yes. Now, people will argue, and they'll say, that can't be an altar, because the Bible clearly says you have to construct the altar of multiple stones. Yeah. Eventually, it did say that. Yeah. But it didn't say that at this point. No. At this particular moment, Noah was just looking for a place to make a sacrifice. <laughs> God gave instructions about how to build altars much, much later. Fascinating, Rick. I did not know that piece. And this, you can't really tell. This is the cloud covering Mount Ararat mm -hmm. and Lower Ararat. Yeah. And this is where Noah and his family offered their first sacrifice. And the rainbow would have appeared here. Mm. And you know, I have been here at moments when a rainbow appears, and Man. I love it when a rainbow shows up. <laughs> and this is where God smelled the incense of the sacrifice, and the presence of God came down. Wow. And this is where God said, no more eating of blood. Now that is a weird thing that God said. Of all the things that God could have said when they came off the boat, yeah, it was the first law given. No more eating and drinking of blood. Why is that, Rick? Because the giants were cannibals, mm. and they ate and they drank blood, mm. filled the earth with violence. And so God said to Noah, okay, son, we're not going to go back where we just came from. Yeah. Never again cannibalism. And that's why God gave that as the first strange law after they exited the That earth. is fascinating. All of that's in that book. Oh, this book is packed with information. And a lot of pictures and photos and graphs. If you want to be a quick, easy read, it's wonderful. If you want to go deep, this book will provide that. Well, I pray people are blessed. Oh, man. Let's, let's watch this. And if you look at this, this is cut with human instrumentation. This is where this actually the bloodletting took place. And this is a channel which is built with human instruments all the way Amazing. across the top. So the blood could flow all the way this direction and over and off the stone. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 8 that the very first thing Noah did when they came off the ark was to offer a sacrifice. And think about it. Oh, they had so much to be thankful for. They did. They had just been through the worst cataclysmic event oh, of history. My goodness. And when they stepped off the boat, it was a world of mud. It was. They needed mercy. They needed help. They did. And Noah must have said, hey guys, yep. we as a family need to offer a sacrifice to say thank you. And we need to offer a sacrifice to ask for God's help and God's favor. And they gave their best right here. And the sign that showed up is something that I think is being reclaimed by the word of the Lord today. Yes. And in the sky from this place is where they saw the, the rainbow. rainbow. And the, the enemy rainbow. has been trying to steal the rainbow. That's right. But you the know, rainbow belongs Joseph, to the Lord. It, when you think about what the world was like when they walked off that ship, oh, decimated, 
Yeah. The face of the earth had been recontoured. Yes. What a mess. What a mess. And they weren't just thankful for surviving. They needed help. They did. And you know what? To this moment when we need help, it's a good moment to bring a sacrifice. That's right. Say, Lord, I'm bringing you what I have. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking you in exchange to give me your help. That's, and actually, that's what the word prosyukomai, the word for prayer, means. It's a place of exchange wow. where you give something to God and God gives you something in exchange. That's amazing. It's, a, it's an altar of sacrifice. That that's is, what that was. You know what I'd like to? I'd like to go back to where we were on the ARC video. Sure. And um, I want to continue just for a moment because there's a part I want to walk into. So let's, okay. let's continue here. And look where you are. Look below. You're looking into the valley below and just in the distance is lower Lesser Ararat and Greater Ararat, and the here we are. The lava beds out the there. The lava beds, lava and we're beds. on Mount Judy. Yeah, and we're right in the middle where this area was not exposed in 1960. Mm. And only because of that earthquake, this whole area fell out. And now you're actually seeing the sides of the boat because of that 79 earthquake. So the earthquake really helped reveal the shape of the it ship. It did. Wow. Well, Andrew, where are we going to go next? I'm going to show you that special site where they core drilled into the side of the boat and found something special. Please take us there. Let's go. What a time. It looks like we're just easily walking there, but it's but it was a lot of walking. It was a lot of walking. We were grabbing our breath. The terrain the was challenging. This was fascinating right here. There we are. So Look at us. To show us yep. here, but tell me about this particular site. Well, right beside you, uh, on this wall here. You're talking the, about right here? Yeah, where you see the line where the water's been coming down? That's a rib timber, isn't it? Um, yes, it's basically going around the rib timber. You can see the other edge at the top. You sure can. It's about two feet wide, and about two to three inches in is this 20-foot column of solid rib timber, petrified wood. And that's where those metal stakes were bent when they were trying to drive it into the side. Correct, because for the ERT scans, you have to drive in these metal stakes to do the scan, and they couldn't get them in, so they had to actually move them to the left or the right of the fossilized wood. Now tell us what is an it's ERT massive. scan. Well, that uses electricity to peer below the surface. There it is. And there so it as is. the electricity current is going through the surface, it will hit different things like water or air pockets or you know wet soil, dry soil, rocks. And then the computer software can interpret how resistive that material is and make a 3D model. And it's those ERT scans that have revealed all the right angle structures and cavities and rooms. Well, it, some of them, but most of the, those were found by the GPR, which is used as uh, radar. To which peer is below ground, the ground penetrating radar, correct? Exactly. So these are two different techniques that let you peer below the surface and not ha have to destroy the site to look what's below the ground. And what is this hole? Yeah, so this is really cool. So Ron Wyatt did a radar scan here back in the 80s, and he awesome. saw that there was a cavity about 10 feet in to the side of the boat. A real cavity. A cavity. And so he said, let's core drill. He got permission to core drill in, this, like three meters in. So you're talking about that hole right there. That's the hole, yep. That's so all that's left of that Yeah, it used to be drilling. almost uh, completely uh, open, but now it's kind of filled in. But they took material out, this matrix of mud and other things, and they put it in a, a Ziploc bag, took it back to a laboratory in America, and the lab technician was pulling it apart under a microscope, and he discovered red animal hair, oh. and a man-made fiber. This which, you would, which you would not find in a yeah. natural jig Yeah, formation. 20, uh, th three meters in, 10 feet in, to the side of this boat that just, this was all <laughs> covered before the 1979 earthquake. And so they went, you know, after the earthquake exposed the side, they drilled in and they found this material, animal hair and a man-made fiber. So what else <laughs> would be down there? So we are looking at a giant ship covered in mud. Yes, that's it. What do you guys think about this? It's amazing. I have to say, when I, we came around the ridge, I was so moved, I bursted into tears because it it's become so real. Yeah. It becomes so real and so personal and, and, and the massiveness of, of what they did. Even, even what we're talking about is a revelation because God's revealing something through this. As, as you said, earthquakes revealed it to different times, and I believe it's being revealed again mm. for our time. Joseph, Joel? I'm just thinking about all the logic. God is very logical, <laughs> and he's a supernatural God. And I'm just thinking about all the things that are left behind, all the breadcrumbs that we can find through oh, logic like and science. I like that. And it makes so much sense 
what we're seeing. Denise? Well, I just think of the miracle that it's been still held together. You know, in a certain way, it disappeared for all those thousands of years. But it was still there. But the mud preserved it. Yeah, wow. for this time, the time we're alive today. Time. You know, it's also amazing to me that if you study what all the ancient voices wrote about the ark, many of them talked about amazing. just coming down from the Silk Road, which is right at the very top of the ridge, amazing. just above where the ark first landed. When we get to the top, I'll point it out. Well, they all wrote about how they would take a detour from the Silk Road, come down to the ark, and they would take pieces of it from the side where it was covered with the biticum and the tar and the pitch. Remarkable. And they would make them into little amulets that they would carry. But of course, that's when the ark was about 1,500 feet higher up the side of the hill. It's slid down the hill over thousands of years to this location. And now it is held in this place. And do you all see what I mean when I said everything around it moves? Absolutely. You really can. But this object never yes. moves. You know, Joseph, that's, for me, this is just a couple hours from Moscow. Amazing. And when I see this video that we're looking at, it's like a homing device inside me. Something in me is thinking, I want to go back there. Come on. The, and when you're there, there's such an echo that this is really where it all started. I'll go I, with I you. I want to go back. I'll go with you. What a privilege. What a privilege. Rick, I believe that we are in a monumental sign of our time. And if we have ears to hear, I believe we can hear what the Spirit is saying. And I believe the word is, we're going to rise above the storm. I and are. I believe we're going into a redemptive instability, but we are going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But we are headed for some very bumpy and turbulent days. Well, think about the flood. Yeah. It was instability, but it was redemptive. It was redemptive. It was completely redemptive. And it started over, you yeah. know. But I, I believe we're going into these times. So this has been just awesome. Thank you for it's having been, me. Oh, thank you. And, and I want to mention to everybody, Again, this is, of course, Rick's book, uh, you know, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. This book, you got to get it. You really need this book. It'll, it'll help you. Uh, the, the Ark is just a small portion of this book, and he goes into so many things that I think is so relevant for today that you, you really need this. So I encourage you to get it. You can get it at josephz.com. You can get it, of course, at renner.org or wherever books are sold. I encourage you to do that. And uh, Rick, I'm just grateful for you. Thank you, brother. I'm, I'm just grateful, grateful for, for you. you. Thank you for everything. Would you mind praying for everybody today? Let's join hands. Okay. Father, we thank you for every person that's with us. Yes, Lord. And the privilege that we could be together. Yes. Lord, you say where two or three are gathered together, you are there. We're here. We've got friends with us. Yes. You are there. And Jesus, I ask you to meet every need of every person. Yes, Lord. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Rick, thank you today for being with me. Thank you, Mr. Z. With everybody. Well, let me look right at you. Remember this. Even on a bad day, you are anointed to be the best there is. And a man or woman with a revelation is not at the mercy of a culture going mad. You got to remember this. God wants you to keep watching, keep discerning, keep knowing the signs of the times because he's leading you and he's guiding you. Man, I'm so thankful for our partners. I'm thankful for all of you. We got so much more to do. Thank you for standing with us. We are standing with you. And if you want to join our partner family, please do it today by going to josephz.com. Now, don't go anywhere. Please watch this part. I wanted to say a very special thank you to our partners. Partners, thank you. Whether you've been a partner with us since the very beginning, the early days, or whether you've recently become a part of our partner family, I want to just simply thank you. Because of you, we're able to do so many things that we could never have accomplished without you working with us together. We're so grateful for you. And from the very bottom of our hearts, we wanted to say thank you to you. And we pray for you every day and we stand with you. And we're believing God is going to do magnificent things through this partner family in the coming days. As a matter of fact, I have a promise from the Holy Spirit about it. Now, if you want to become part of our partner family, or you're even on the fence about it, thinking about it, I would encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com, or you can text the keyword GIVE to 719-259-0029. Your partnership helps us advance the gospel, and it helps us fulfill the commission God's given us to raise up a million to reach a billion. That's lives. A million clear-eyed, clear-minded reformers to go win a billion. A million for a billion. And we know we can do it with your help. I believe with your help, we can impact the world. And we're looking forward to stepping into this at a greater capacity than ever 
before. I just want to say thank you and invite you to the family by going to josephz.com today. Well, I'm standing here outside our World Broadcast Center. Now, with the World Broadcast Center, we have a little bit extra land that's on it. Not much, but just enough that if we wanted to add on, we could. I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment, but right now I wanna thank so many of you who've participated in making this building what it is. Now, we're getting to the point, we're going to take a major lunge forward by faith and by really good planning. And that has to do with television and advanced media. Now we're already taking dramatic steps. One very exciting thing that's happening is the Sid Roth Network has reached out to us and they're having us air our live broadcasts every day simultaneously with their television network. A simpler way of saying it is, when we go live in the morning, they will air that live on their TV network. And I gotta tell you, it is amazing what the Lord's doing to open doors for us and our partners to reach more and more viewers and people all around the world. But to really accomplish this, we've got to develop a call center, a call center that's gonna really help you and your family. We wanna to minister to you more. We wanna be able to be present for you in a greater capacity. The way we wanna move forward is with a new call center. And I'm talking high touch that beats high tech every time. What does that mean? It means when you call in that you get somebody. We're here for you in real time during our live broadcast. And we have a place that We'll reach out and minister to you, our partners. And we just want to be here for you. If you're a viewer, a partner, we want to be available. And we have to make a place or more room for the production of our materials, meaning shipping out books to you and teachings and so much more that we are just getting into right now. And that means we have to finish this building. And to do that, we need your help. We need your help through your donations, your time, anything that you can do. By time, I mean prayer, in any way that you can spend your efforts through prayer and faith with us, we so appreciate it. But more than anything else, we're looking for partners that will help us finish this building. And if you have any interest in really sewing into this today and standing with us over the World Broadcast Center, the total cost that we have left to knock this out, to get done with phase one, we're calling it phase one because it's the studios, the building payment to pay it off in full, and in addition to that, to remodel everything inside is 1.2 million. And we're looking to knock that out this year. We need your help, we wanna see this advance, and we're thrilled about it. And I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you who've helped with this so far, you've sewn, you've stood with us, but we have a little bit more to go, and I'd encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com and helping us finish up this project so we can move forward and better serve you and the body of Christ. We're so grateful. Remember, it's a million for a billion. And here we are at the World Broadcast Center, and I believe that we together can get this done very quickly. I love you, I bless you, and thank you for your support. I wanna tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna to begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building, and helping us with the budget of airtime. And it is gonna be a monumental thing, and the Lord has given us favor, and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target, I know we can walk through the door, and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. 
And I'm asking you if you'd consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you want to become a partner, or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're going to reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting this amazing open door. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, we're so excited to share that a Joseph Z is now a programmer on Daystar. And his show, Voice of God, is dedicated to prophetic jour- journalism and faith-filled Bible teaching for the last days. You'll hear unique commentary and biblical teachings that will empower you to see the world through a watchman's lens so you'll know what's coming and what to do about it. And of course, his program debuts this Thursday at 10 p.m. Mark that down. Those of you that love Joseph, and uh, that's 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And here's a look at what you can expect. I'm Joseph Z, and at the age of nine, I had a life-altering encounter with the voice of God. Throughout my life, I discovered God is always speaking. The question is, are you listening? There's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Simply put, the office of the prophet is a responsibility to a segment of the body of Christ. You see that in Ephesians 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Office gifts are there to edify and equip the body, where when you look at different abilities in the body, such as the gift of prophecy, there's not an assignment to the segment of the body. It's not a responsibility. It's just a gift that a person in the body carries. When a person with a gift of prophecy has a responsibility put on them for the body of Christ, a certain section of believers, they are called to step into that with responsibility. That's the difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. All right, I'm excited about that, aren't you? Absolutely. Joseph's Joseph a great teacher. I love listening to him. New programmer. Personal friend, and it's gonna be you're gonna be encouraged. 